Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. This is a video I've wanted to put out for a while. It's a compilation of all my favorite Underworld videos that I have made in the past. So this will be the ultimate Underworld lore video. All the vampire covens explained, how vampires and lichens came to be, how Victor became the first vampire elder, and more. I hope you enjoy this extra long video. And if you enjoy videos like this about Underworld and other fantasy series, maybe leave a like and subscribe if you haven't. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the video. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Underworld video. In this video we're going to be covering Victor the Vampire Elder, which is personally one of my favorite characters. Also before I get started, if you guys have any other suggestions of videos you'd like me to cover, please leave them down in the comments and I'll definitely read through them. Victor is a Vampire Elder who appeared fully in the movies Underworld and Underworld Rise of the Lycans and is also kind of partially in Underworld Evolution. Victor was a Hungarian general and warlord born sometime in the 5th century according to Andreas Tanis. Victor was a ruthless and cruel Hungarian warlord and is described as having ruled over his domain with an iron fist. As Victor was nearing the end of his life, Marcus Corvinus, the first vampire, came to him with an offer, immortality in exchange for Victor's military expertise and army in combating the werewolves. These were the spawn of Marcus's twin brother, William. Marcus then turned Victor who then also proceeded to turn his entire army which became the forerunners for what would later be known as the Death Dealers. With his newly turned army of immortals, Victor launched his war against the werewolves. Again, it's important to note that werewolves are the first victims of William Corvinus and cannot turn back into the human form like lichens can. They turn into the wolf form, remain that way forever, and have an unquenchable savage lust for blood. In 1202 AD, the vampires were finally able to locate and capture William. Victor promised Marcus he would not harm William despite the werewolf's uncontrollable nature. In order for him to deal with the problem without breaking his word, Victor had Amelia, the third vampire elder, deal with William. Victor and Amelia finally managed to find William and the werewolf was captured. Victor then betrayed Marcus though, giving orders to keep William as far away from Marcus as possible. However, with the death dealers loyal to Victor, Marcus could do nothing. Even though Marcus is stronger than Victor, Victor had an entire army of immortals at this point, so Marcus didn't have much of a choice but to go along with what he said. Victor locked away William in a prison where he could not harm anyone or create more of his kind. Victor kept two keys to William's prison. The small one he kept as a necklace which he gave to his daughter Sonia. The larger one, however, he kept with him at all times, going as far to have it welded to his rib cage and be kept under his skin so that Marcus could not find it as Victor knew that if Marcus was given the chance, he would try to free William. The relationship between the two vampire elders was always strained. Victor, with Amelia's support, undercut Marcus's power as ruler of the vampire coven, ensuring Marcus would never have the strength to free his brother. However, Victor never staged an outright coup against Marcus, as he had been told that should Marcus ever die, all in his bloodline would follow him to the grave, including Victor. To prevent this from happening, the chain was constructed, a system in which only one elder ruled while the other two slumbered. So Marcus basically lied to Victor and told him that if Marcus was killed, all other vampires would die, which Marcus probably knew was not true, but he had to do something because he knew at this point he was expendable and he had to give Victor a reason to keep him around. Victor even domesticated a new breed of the vampire's enemies, a humanized version of the werewolves known as lichens. He used them as watchdogs to guard the vampires during the daylight hours. Lucian was the first lichen born to a werewolf mother in the dungeons of Castle Corvinus. This was probably a result of his mother being bitten while he was in the womb and his body might have been able to change the virus slightly so that he maintained control over himself while being in wolf form and could control his transformations. In the movie Rise of the Lycans, we see Victor meeting with some human nobles and they say that the beasts are at Victor's door too and if he cannot protect them why are they paying him? So protecting humans from the werewolf outbreak caused by William Corvinus seemed to be a way for the vampires to earn some income to supply their needs. Even though William was already captured at this time, Victor must have been having troubles with the overwhelming number of werewolves that had already been created and were still infecting more people. This could have been the reason that Victor tried to use the Lycans as daylight guardians in the first place to help protect against the rising werewolf threat. Victor would get new Lycan bodyguards by capturing humans and forcing them to be bit by a Lycan. This is how we see Rays being turned, who appears in the first Underworld movie. The vampires also developed a special collar for the Lycans. 
This collar would be placed and locked around their neck, and this would keep them from transforming, as if they did transform, their size would increase dramatically, and then the spike necklace would kill them. So this was a way that Victor kept the lichens kind of weakened so that he could control them easier. As we know, not every human can become a lichen or vampire, and most die after being bit within an hour. So most of the humans that Victor had bit by the lichens probably died. Around 1210 AD, Victor had a daughter named Sonia with a woman named Lona. Much of Victor's relationship with Lona is unknown. Lona died in labor while giving birth to Sonia, which is why she's never seen in the movie Rise of the Lichens. Almost 200 years after her birth, Sonia falls in love with a lichen named Lucian and becomes pregnant. Victor eventually discovers this and fears the blending of the species that would result should the child be born. He and the council condemn Sonia, Lucian, and their unborn child to death. Sonia is burnt alive to exposure to sunlight while Lucian, chained to the floor, is forced to watch. Before Lucian's execution, while weakened by silver and chained to the floor, he uses the full moon to help transform and escape, but not before taking Sonia's pendant with him. He then summons his lichens and the original werewolves to battle during which time Victor personally duels Lucian. Although the Vampire Elder is much more powerful, Lucian makes sure to use Victor's weaknesses against him. Sunlight to incapacitate the Elder, and then stabs him through the mouth. Although at the end of the movie, Rise of the Lycans, Victor seems to be dead, he manages to survive and retreats with Andreas Tannis and the other Elders, while the rest of the Vampire Coven are slaughtered by the Lycans. These events mark the beginning of the Vampire Lycan War. So at this point, Lucian has half the key to William's prison, so Victor was determined to make sure that no one would find out the location to William's prison, especially Marcus and Lucian. He slaughters Celine's family because it was her father that was commissioned to build William's prison. But due to her uncanny resemblance to Sonia, instead of killing her, he turns her and proceeds to treat her almost like his own daughter. The war rages on and eventually draws to a close after Lucian is seemingly killed by a vampire named Craven. After this, Victor gathers more power for himself, making himself the leader of the Old World Coven. And going so far as to alter history, in the revised version of the history set out by Victor, he, not Marcus, is the original vampire in time. He exiles the official historian Andreas Tannis, who was the only person who knew that Marcus was the first vampire. So that's the reason Andreas Tannis was exiled to the monastery we see him at in Underworld Evolution, because he was the only one who knew that Victor was not the real first vampire, and Victor didn't want anyone to find that out, as it could possibly undermine his power over the coven. There was probably a lot of other events that he likely altered or erased them altogether. To what extent he erased the history concerning Sonya is unclear. Whether he shared the information that she was pregnant with a hybrid baby, or that he was the one that sentenced her to death is unclear. Obviously her absence would have to be explained, and perhaps some high-ranking members, namely the Elders, maybe Craven and Tannis, were notified. Selene did not know of this, nor was it permitted for anyone to dig into vampire history if no one else survived the Lycan attack on the castle, in which case only Victor and Tannis knew the full story. Other revised events included responsibility for the war, which he blamed entirely on Lucian. Concerning the events in the first Underworld movie, in 2003 Victor is hibernating, not to be awakened for another hundred years. However, Selene awakens him ahead of time, convinced that Lucian is still alive, and knows that Craven has made a deal with him. A furious Victor confronts his protege, condemning her to be judged. Notably, Victor seems to be more upset by Selene's relationship with a lichen named Michael Corvin than her claims of Craven's treachery. Victor orders Selene be locked away until Amelia and the council can arrive and decide her fate, which Victor undoubtedly knows will be a death sentence. A tearful Selene begs Victor to allow her to provide proof of her claims, but he ignores her. Selene ends up finding out that Craven indeed did not kill Lucian, and the two had actually conspired and made a deal to kill the vampire elders. So one of the people that Victor trusted him most, that he named Regent of the Budapest Coven, was actually planning to undermine him the entire time. Upon learning the truth of Selene's claims, and learning that Amelia has been assassinated by the Lycans, Victor becomes enraged. Victor then punches the Lycan that they have on the floor, tearing open half of his face and killing him instantly. A guilty Victor apologizes to Selene for not believing her, and the two have to pursue Craven. However, neither vampire pays any mind to the Lycan's blood spreading over the floor over the chambers of the Elders, unaware of the consequences that would ensue from that. Victor promptly launches a full-scale assault on the Lycan lair, 
effortlessly breaking the neck of a transformed lichen named Raze, who was one of the most powerful lichens, then driving his sword through his chest. Craven attempts to escape, but is forced to run and hide each time he sees Victor. Victor eventually comes upon Selene, who is in the process of biting Michael. Turning him into the first hybrid in the series is a last ditch attempt to save his life from being shot by the silver nitrate bullets. Furious, Victor tosses Selene away from Michael and throws the ladder through the wall into a flooded courtyard. Unknown to Victor, Craven had actually revealed to Selene that Victor was the one who had murdered her entire family, not the Lycans. Selene tearfully confronts Victor, accusing him of killing her family and murdering Sonya. Victor protests that he has given her immortality in return, a gift he insists is way more important than her family was. When confronted by Sonya's death, however, Victor claims that he loved his daughter dearly, but he was forced to kill her to protect the vampire species. Selene still clearly disagrees with Victor's actions, and he abandons her so that he can find and kill Michael. Victor is then confronted by his ultimate fear. Selene's bite is reacted with the lichen virus and the pure Corvina strain in Michael's body him being a descendant of the first immortal Alexander Corvinus, causing the traits of both lichen and vampire to appear. Michael attacks Victor, initially showing speed and strength unmatched by even the vampire elder. However, Victor, using Michael's lack of combat experience to his advantage, Victor having at this point hundreds upon hundreds of years of combat experience, is able to subdue him. Victor's bodyguards come to finish off the hybrid, but Selene kills them. She is then punched aside by Victor. Michael rushes to her aid but is overtaken by Victor who begins to strangle him. Upon seeing this, Selene makes the decision to kill Victor, which was probably not an easy decision considering he's basically been like a father to her for most of her life. She then slices his head in half with his own sword, saving Michael and avenging both her family, Lucian, and Sonya all at the same time. I also wanted to mention that in the first Underworld movie, the lichen scientist that Lucian has working on mixing the lichen and vampire strains together state that if Lucian wants to become a more powerful hybrid, he will need the blood of an elder, which he also tells to Victor. So this kind of proves to some degree that the blood of an elder is better and the virus is stronger in an elder than it is in just a regular vampire. So by extension, Victor would definitely be stronger than most other vampires, probably aside from Marcus. Also, even after Victor's death, we know that he's still revered greatly among the vampires, as we see that his coat is hung up on display in Thomas's coven in the movie Underworld Awakening. Victor does appear in the movie Underworld Evolution, or more accurately, his dead body appears in the movie Underworld Evolution. Victor's body is retrieved by the Cleaners, an organization dedicated to cleaning up after the vampire lichen war, led by the original immortal Alexander Corvinus. Alexander extracts the key from beneath Victor's flesh, only to later have it snatched by his son Marcus, unfortunately. Victor's dead body is most likely destroyed when Alexander Corvinus blows up his own ship. Although not a pure-born vampire, or a high-born, Victor is nevertheless obsessed with the purity of bloodlines, as shown in his attempts to establish a hierarchy by trying to arrange for Sonya to become an elder. His fixation on blood purity is so great that he considers his victory over various lichens to be only natural as he views them as nothing more than animals and slaves. Due to this, he views the possibility of a hybrid as an abomination. He takes extreme measures to prevent such a creature from ever existing. Victor also views immortality as a gift above all others, as we see when he tries to reason with Selene, when she discovers he had killed her entire family, and states that his gift to Selene should more than make up for what he has taken from her. His interest in blood purity is also exhibited in Victor's false claims that he and Amelia are pure-born vampires, which is impossible because they were some of the first vampires ever turned by Marcus, and they wouldn't have been able to be even close to the same age as Marcus if they were actually pure-borns. Also, at some point prior to 1402, Victor was the one who turned Samira in unknown circumstances, Victor later, presumably after Sonya's death, began to favor Samira in particular. However, around the time that Selene was turned by Victor, he then sent Samira away to the Nordic Coven. Hello and welcome back to another Underworld video. This video is going to be about all the vampire covens in the Underworld series. Covens are a gathering or community of vampires. 
A coven is a group of vampires who gather together for ceremonies, rituals, and or celebrations. The number of members of a coven may vary. A coven can simply be vampires that live together and try to do so in relative peace. Some covens are friendlier than others and are like family to one another. Most covens have members that tend to keep to themselves and really just view the coven as a place to live. Other members focus more on their lives as warriors, training to become hunters and killers, specifically of lichen. These are known as death dealers. All covens have their own rules and laws to abide by, since covens are called sectors in the Blood Wars comic, implying the covens are divided into different sectors based on the four cardinal points in their home countries. As in any group or society, the Vampire Coven also has its own hierarchy, which helps define and shape the Vampire Society as a civilized community. Differing themselves from the Lycans and their primitive packs, any vampire can potentially rise through the ranks if they achieve enough respect and deeds within the Vampire Society. There are several ranks within certain positions in a coven. The Vampire Elders, also known as Grand Elders and Great Elders, hold the highest power in any coven and all vampires must answer to them. The only exception being maybe another elder. They are viewed as kings slash queens of the Vampire Society. They are the ones that ultimately choose and decide how the vampire community must act and behave. They are also the ones who elect their trusted advisors and regions. They can also sentence members to death in the case of treason, as Victor sentenced Sonya to death for having an affair with a lichen. They all have the power to create and found new covens. In the Underworld Blood Wars comic, Selene states that they shall forge new alliances, reclaim their covens, and create new strongholds. The chain was created to avoid clashes of decisions among the three Grand Elders, with only one of the Elders ruling at a time. The chain is also meant to overthrow Marcus from his status of first and more powerful vampire and keep him from trying to free his brother, William. Even in their absence, their will is respected and carried out. The children and direct descendants of the Grand Elders are raised to eventually become Elders themselves due to their royal heritage, such as Sonia and David. Regents and Coven Leaders the regents are the ones chosen by the elders to represent them in the covens and be in charge of all their affairs and estate during their absence in the covens. The coven leaders rule their covens in place of a regent, the elders, and the council. They also belong to the nobility of the vampire society but seem to be less mobile than the council as they usually stay in their houses. All vampires that rank below them obey and serve them without question and their orders are only overruled by the elders. If a regent dies, another is chosen to succeed him, either by an elder or the council, and if neither is present or unable to do it, the coven itself can choose one to lead them due to popular vote. Regents can be chosen by the elders for their past achievements as warriors and or their leadership skills, as they already have a natural respect among the members of their respective covens. Some are also friends or related to the elders themselves. An example of this would be Craven, who was the former regent of the Old World Coven. They also have the Heads of House. The Heads of House presumably are the ones responsible for the well-being of the Coven Stronghold and its members, making sure everyone is doing their job. They rule the Coven Stronghold when there is no Elders, Regents, Coven Leaders or Council members present. Not much is known about the full extent of their duties and responsibilities. A Head of House can also be a Council member in which they have more power than the other Council members as long as they are in the Coven ruled by said Head of House. Samira herself was a head of house and a council member, and when she attempted to overthrow the council, all the present vampires followed her without question as she had more influence within the coven than the rest of the council. Only when David was acknowledged as the heir of the elder, he gained more influence and was able to overrule her orders to kill the council. Samira is the only known head of house. There's also high-ranking members. The high-ranking members are the ones that are considered the upper class of the covens. Some are closely related to the higher ranks as descendants, siblings, or spouses of them. Others are fairly older vampires with several centuries of servitude to their covens and or have achieved a great level of respect and influence among their kind. Certain members of this class have more diplomatic tasks or errands like the dignitaries and envoys who travel to other covens and arrive prior to the elders and the council members to make sure everything is to their liking and prepares the coven for their arrival. All of them are wealthy, having direct ties with companies like Ziodex Industries, which supplies more income to their covens. There is also the socialites who prefer to spend a significant amount of time attending various fashionable social gatherings. Highborns, children, and descendants of the elders are also considered high-ranking members. There's also vampire aristocrats. 
The aristocrats are the ones deemed to convey an approximate rank intermediate between the highest and lowest titles of the coven's hierarchy. They can also be related to higher ranks, but don't contribute as much to the covens as the high-ranking members do. They are usually vampires that were once nobles like ladies, lords, counts, countesses, and any other rank of nobility when they were humans. When they join a coven, they maintain their noble status as they likely chose to become immortals, which allows them to live in power and wealth for eternity. And of course we can't forget about the Death Dealers. The Death Dealers are the military forces of the Vampire Society and the closest to a law enforcement group within a coven. Any lower or higher ranking vampire can become a Death Dealer if they so desire to become one. The Death Dealers are the warriors trained specifically to become the Hunters of Lycans, but they can also be tasked to defend a coven during an attack. Some of them can be chosen by a region or elder to be their personal bodyguards and to deal with their individual matters outside the coven's stronghold, similar to an elite guard. The Death Dealers seem to have more privileges than the lower ranked vampires as they are able to leave the houses as they please and spend several days outside it. They must also have their own military ranks as they have at least one vampire that leads their troops and gives them orders during combat, as well also have recruits that are considered lower rank, which are still in the training process to become death dealers. And then lastly on the list we have just ordinary vampires. These are the lowest ranks of vampires, and the most common members of the covens. The vampires that become part of the coven begin at this rank, having fewer privileges than any other superior ranks. These vampires have more mundane jobs, usually serving as maids, servants, attendants, drivers, ladies-in-waiting, and doormen, being tasked with domestic work. Some also serve as doctors, blacksmiths, and engineers, helping to improve the coven's stability. Attendants serve the high-ranking members of the coven, and the ladies-in-waiting attend to the vampire elder, Amelia, and presumably the female council members. Among these are also the coven historians, like Andreas Tannis, which are the ones responsible for recording vampire history and the history of the coven and are one of the few lower ranks that have access to the elders and the council. It's interesting to note that vampires don't rise to a social status until they reach at least a full mortal lifespan and age, or they can shortcut to the upper echelons of vampire society if they have gained a reputation as a war hero or if they come romantically involved with higher ranks. Despite their lower ranks, they still live in relative luxury, usually being present at parties and ceremonies. They don't seem to leave their houses and prefer the safety of its walls. Most are socially engaged and seem to know every gossip within their covens. When an ordinary pureborn vampire is born, they are usually viewed with more respect and are already considered of a higher rank despite their younger age compared to some of the ordinary vampires. Ordinary vampires are also known as lowborns. The Old World Coven is the oldest coven of vampires that is located in Europe. The coven likely had a different title before 1873, when the cities of Buda, Pest, and Abuda were united to form the city of Budapest. The Old World Coven was formed in the 6th century, as the vampires began to take action against the powerful enemy, the werewolves. When Hungarian warlord Victor agreed to wage war on the werewolves on behalf of Marcus Corvinus in return for immortality that turned his army into the first death dealers. The foundation for a society was laid. Under the leadership of the three vampire elders, this society grew and rules were established. Thus, the covenant and the coven with it were conceived. Victor and Amelia, two of the three vampire elders, sought to undermine Marcus's authority, which implies this may have been the primary reason a vampire council was formed and the chain was conceived. In the third film, taking place in medieval times, a large number of coven members are seen in a secluded mountain fortress of Castle Corvinus. However, it is unlikely that this was the vampire's only settlement at the time, as Samiria is known to have been a region of the Budapest Coven for an unspecified period of time prior to being sent to the Nordic Coven in 1402 or 1403. At some unknown point, the growing vampire coven would also spread out to branches over the continent, establishing power bases and extending its reach to countries like the Paris Coven in France and the Nordic Coven in Scandinavia. Later, the vampires colonized America and established the New World Coven, most likely with a base in New York. By the 21st century, as seen in the first film, a number of members had gathered at a secluded mansion, but it remains unknown how large a part of the coven's population they represented. The vampires in the coven owned Ziodex Industries, which had begun manufacturing synthetic blood. This medical company is one of the reasons that the covens can afford such lavish places to live.
The infrastructure of the coven is largely unknown. There is an occasional mention of houses, but it remains unclear if a house is synonymous with a coven or if a coven can consist of several houses, much like a royal court. What is clear is that the elders sit at the heart of the coven. Their commands either enforced or tempered by the council, while the death dealers stand guard and wait to do their bidding. The regent enjoys considerable status, but the extent of his political power remains unclear. Since more than one coven exists, it is possible that the position of regents was conceived to rule the covens while in turn being ruled by the vampire council. Also, at least by modern times, there are dignitaries that may act as envoys when diplomacy is called for. One such position seen an envoy of the elder Amelia, who is most likely entrusted to a member of the elite. As the current regent Craven keeps a large personal bodyguard consisting of Soren and his men in the form of an entourage of retainers, it is possible that the elite keep retainers for various purposes as a sign of status. The Old World Coven was destroyed when Marcus is awakened and burns it to the ground, killing most if not all of the vampires within before setting the blaze. It is unknown who gained control of the Zyodex industries after this. It could have been one of the other covens such as the Eastern Coven. Some of the notable members of the Old World Coven include Sonia, Victor, Andreas Tanis, Erica, Soren, Craven, and Selene. The Eastern Coven, also known as the Corvinus Coven and the Eastern Sector, is a coven of vampires led by Cassius, Samira, and the other members of the Vampire Council. Their seat of power is a castle, possibly located in Prague. As the son of the vampire elder Amelia, David is the pure-blooded heir to the Eastern Coven. The Eastern Coven was founded in the 6th century by the vampire elder Amelia. At some point, Samira joined the Eastern Coven, having disliked the Nordic Coven's way of life and having been previously sent away from the Old World Coven by her sire, the Vampire Elder Victor. Whether the rest of the Elite Council have been part of the Coven since it was founded, or whether they came to the Eastern Coven from other Covens at a later date is unknown. During roughly the last decade of Amelia's final rule, she left the Coven, despite supposedly being with the New World Coven at this point in time, and traveled to the Nordic Coven with her mate Thomas to give birth to their son David, but Victor, or possibly Craven on Victor's behalf, grew suspicious of her whereabouts, so he sent Samira to investigate. However, by the time Samira and her troops arrived, Amelia had left the Nordic Coven and returned to the Eastern Coven, Thomas having already returned to his own coven, taking David with him. Years later, the Eastern Coven is one of the only two known covens to have survived the purges alongside the Nordic Coven, making it the epicenter of the vampire world. Once David proves himself to be Amelia's heir, and thus the rightful ruler of the coven, the death dealers in the council side with him against Samira. Shortly afterwards, the Lycans launch a massive attack on the coven, which they nearly win before Selene arrives with the Nordic coven to help in battle. Samira is killed by David, while Selene's enhanced powers enable her to kill Marius. Once Marius is dead, the Lycans end their attack on the Eastern Coven and retreat. Following the battle, Selene, David, and Lena are chosen as the new Vampire Elders by the Eastern Coven and its council. The castle of the Eastern Coven contains a foyer, a training room, armory, dungeons, and living quarters. All of the rooms are decorated in a gothic fashion, except the training room and the armory, which are very modern. With much of the decor being black and therefore contrasting with the white stone that the castle is built from, most of the floors appear to be a highly polished stone, possibly marble, which have been arranged by color to create large sweeping patterns. The castle goes into lockdown in the daytime, with gates barring the entrance to the castle grounds, all located at strategic points and normally manned by security guards. Metal shutters are automatically lowered, completely covering the doors and windows to keep the sun out. Some windows, and likely some doors, do have buttons located nearby that act as manual overrides and allow a vampire to lower, raise, or to prevent the shutters from being lowered or raised on that particular window. The castle has surveillance cameras located at strategic spots to ensure the protection and safety of the coven. Amelia installed a series of secret passageways throughout the castle that leads to the private chambers, including Samira's. However, very few know of these passages, not even the head of house at the time of the Lycan assault, Samira seemed to be aware of them. The only person shown to know of them is Amelia's former lover, Thomas, and their son, David. The doors that lead to the private chambers have a peephole to see into the private chambers. That's a little weird. And now we're on to the Nordic Coven. The Nordic Coven, also known as Vardor, 
is a coven of vampires led by Vidar. Their seat of power is in a castle located in the northern peak of Scandinavia. Amelia founded the Nordic Coven and helped them in times of need. Samira was once sent to the Nordic Coven, however, despite her time with the Coven, Samira disagreed with their more peaceful ways. After Amelia died, the mourning ceremony they had for her lasted a month. The Nordic Coven is way more independent than any of the other Covens, as they did not answer to the Council and lived as they wished, away from the politics and the wars among their species. It would seem that many are unaware of this coven's existence, with some believing that the Nordic Coven is only a legend. Many Nordic vampires in the coven have participated in a sacred ritual, which also enhances their powers. Samira declined or wasn't worthy to undergo the ritual during her time at the coven. The specific location of the coven is not stated in the film, however, given its name, it is most likely situated on one of the Nordic countries. David and Celine traveled to the coven from the Eastern Coven by train, and the coven's castle is seen to be in a mountainous region and near a lake. This terrain is consistent with much of Norway and Western Sweden and the Scandinavian mountains. The Nordic Coven is located at the top of a frozen cliff, which can be used as a natural defense against outside threats. Inside of its walls, there are several domestic and working areas. Some of these places are the courtyard, the armory, and the undercroft. The Nordic Coven is far removed from the contemporary vampire society and seems to lack any modern technology, relying mostly on its medieval architecture and their monastic ways. At the entrance, there is a great bell which is used to sound an alarm when the coven is under attack. Passing through it is the main stairway that leads further down into the castle. Inside of it, there are no windows and has several fireplaces to keep the temperature agreeable. The ice and the torches seem to be some of the few decorations within the castle along with several artifacts like metal plaques, wall runes, and lichen skulls. Thomas's sword is also on display. Passing through the main gatehouse, there is a courtyard, the only outdoor place within the castle walls. The courtyard has stairs and balconies on either side. This area is constantly covered in snow given the region's cold weather. The courtyard is the first line of defense when under attack. It also has ramparts and a fortified outpost situated over the gate, which is used by archers for flanking positions. The Gathering Room is where Nordic vampires gather to talk, lecture, and discuss important events. Like the rest of the castle, the walls, floors, and ceiling are made of stone. Many tables around the fireplaces can be seen here. The Gathering Room also has a stone archway and is located near where the display stand of Thomas's sword and Amelia's blood memories were kept. These were the blood memories ingested by the Vampire Council to prove that David was actually the true heir of Amelia's to be the Vampire Elder. The last part of the Nordic Coven I want to talk about is the Undercroft. The Undercroft is a crypt underneath the castle halls, similar to a temple where the Nordic vampires go to meditate and perform their sacred rituals. There are several pools and fountains in this area. The vampires use the water to cocoon those that choose to perform the ritual and leave their bodies resting until their awakening. The pools are used as a meditation place in which the vampires don't need to go through the cocooning process again. They simply enter and leave the water as they please. Known members of the Nordic Coven include Amelia, Vidar, Lena, Thomas, David, Samira, and Selene. The New World Coven The New World Coven is a coven of vampires located in America. It is implied that this coven was or still is linked to the Old World Coven, but it remains unknown if this younger coven was originally established by descendants of the Old World Coven or with the elders' consent like a colony and if so, if they ever declared some form of independence. While what role the Elder played in the Younger Coven's history and present remains unknown, by the time of the first film, Amelia, the Council, neatly groomed attendants, ladies-in-waiting, and her bodyguards were returning from New York, most likely a seat of power for the New World Coven. In the first novelization, visiting dignitaries and high-ranking members were also returning from the New World Coven as well. It is clear that the New World Coven at the time held the Elders in high regard and that some form of reunion was set to commence with Marcus's awakening in the 21st century. It remains unknown whether or not the New World Coven survived the purges as the Coven was never mentioned again after the first film. The infrastructure of the New World Coven is unknown. Although it was proven that the New World Coven has death dealers, death dealers were shown accompanying and protecting Amelia and the Council in the first film there is occasionally mention of houses, but it remains unknown if a house is synonymous with the coven 
and or if a coven can even consist of several houses, much like a royal court. It is possible that the New World Coven had or still has a government equivalent to the Old World Coven's council. It is also possible that the council governed the New World Coven as well, since they lived in the New World Coven at the time. And the last thing I wanted to briefly mention in this video was the coven that's led by Thomas. The coven is located in an old, run-down cave-like area underground that is used as a hideout for the vampires after the purges. Thomas's coven is located underground outside the city just below a hydroelectric dam. Given its considerable size and architecture, it must have been constructed prior to the purges. The reason for why it was built and who built it, however, is unclear. It could possibly have been a warehouse used for vampires' general storage, or perhaps an ancient abandoned vampire safe house, or simply made as a safety measure in the event of an attack or an incident with their previous location. The entrance is poorly hidden by a few sacks and a wooden trap door. Beneath there is an ancient looking paved manhole which leads further underground. This manhole has a runic design and requires a round keystone to open, as well as a combination lock. It's unknown if the lock can be closed from the inside or how many keystones existed to open this. Inside the place seems to be in a precarious state, with a lot of dust, humidity, and several gutters and watering holes. Some walls seem to be cracking and others have moss growing in it. They seem to use very little electricity, which is likely provided by the dam. The coven stood in stark contrast to the decadent covens of old. It was bare, run down, and lacking any amenities. The decoration is very likely brought from their old homes, such as drapes, blankets, cutlery, and books. Some items from the Old World Coven were spread throughout Thomas's Coven, including Soren's silver whips, Victor's jacket, and a Death Dealer uniform which reminded the Coven members of their proud past. The living quarters are smaller rooms with small beds that could double as couches. The rooms are lit by candelabras and have rugs on the floor as well as owner's decorations. There was also freezing cavities on the rock walls where they could store some blood sacks. However, it is unknown if it was a natural cooling or if it required electricity to function. The coven possesses many corridors and entrances. There are many objects scattered throughout them, such as weapons, armor, relics, and chests. Known members of this coven are Thomas, the coven leader, David, who is formerly a member, and Olivia, who is the doctor who helped save Eve. Sonia. That's what started the war. Hello everyone and welcome back to another video. We're going to be looking at one of my favorite characters from the Underworld series. Lucian, the first of the Lycans. Michael Sheen plays Lucian. He appears in the first movie that came out in 2003 as the antagonist. But he also appeared in the 2009 film Underworld Rise of the Lycans, the third film in the series that was a prequel. In this film, he was one of the main protagonists. Michael Sheen has appeared in many roles, and not only has he appeared as the leader of the Lycans, but also as the leader of the vampires in Twilight. I wonder what he liked better, being a vampire or a Lycan? Michael Sheen was actually dating Kate Beckinsale, the actor who plays Celine, for seven years and they had a daughter together. They split up in 2002, right before the first Underworld movie came out. Although they split, they are apparently still good friends. Now let's talk about how Lucian became the first Lycan and the difference between full werewolves and Lycans. In the Underworld series, there's vampires and werewolves. But it all started with the original immortal, Alexander Corvinus. He was a warlord and his village in Hungary was stricken by a plague. Most were killed, but somehow he survived because his body was able to mutate the virus in a unique way, so he became the first immortal. Alexander then had three sons. Two of them inherited his immortal genes. Eventually, one was bitten by a bat and the other by a wolf, and this caused their unstable DNA to mutate further, which is how vampires and werewolves were born. The first werewolf, William, is much larger than all other werewolves and cannot take human form. He is also much more aggressive and uncontrollable. Anyone he bites will also turn into the same kind of werewolf that is incapable of human transformations and stricken with rage. A vampire elder named Victor was ruler of Castle Corvinus. There, he kept werewolves enslaved to guard them during the day. A werewolf was being kept in a dungeon, and Victor discovered it had a baby, and it was in human form. This is Lucian, born in 1207. 
Before this, werewolves were stuck in wolf form forever. But because Lucian's mother was bit while pregnant, the Corvina strain had a unique effect on Lucian and caused him to become the first Lycan. This allowed him to not only transform between human and wolf form at will, but he also remained in control of himself while transformed. Victor learned that if he forced a Lycan to bite other humans, they would be turned into this new breed of werewolf as well. We know that not many people can survive the vampire and Lycan curse. Most will die within the first hour of being bitten, so many humans were probably killed so that Victor could make his Lycan slaves. Victor went on to breed Lycans to be their daylight guardians and workforce. Lycans while in human form have much greater strength than a human, great for manual labor. Each Lycan was fitted with a spiked collar, so that if they tried to transform, the collar would kill them. Vampires are stronger than Lycans that are in human form, but once they are in wolf form, a vampire stands no chance. Almost every situation we see a vampire go up against a Lycan, the Lycan easily wins, unless it's an Elder or Selene. This is why it's important to keep the Lycans from taking their true form, because they could easily overpower the vampires. Although Lucian was a slave, he was given special privileges since he was found by Victor and became almost like a stepson to him. He praises Lucian multiple times, and when Lucian is caught after removing his collar, he is punished with a whip, but Victor tells Sonya if it were any other Lycan, they would be dead. Lucian had quite a good job compared to the other Lycans. He was basically their HR rep and he was also a blacksmith. It's important to remember that although Victor hated werewolves, he did not hate Lycans yet like he does in the first movie. He saw them as lesser, but he bred them and let them walk around his castle. That was, until he found out his daughter Sonya had fallen in love with Lucian and become pregnant with the first hybrid child. Over the years, Sonya and Lucian had become close and eventually would secretly meet up. Andreas Tannis, the vampire coven historian, actually aided Sonya and Lucian in their escape in exchange for Sonya's seat on the vampire council. Unfortunately, Victor found out before they could escape and sentenced Lucian, Sonya, and their unborn child to death. Sonya and her child were killed by sunlight, but Lucian managed to escape and free his Lycan brothers. This event changed Lucian. It was the event that sparked the vampire Lycan war that would last centuries. When Lucian escaped, he had silver in him, which is supposed to stop Lycans from transforming. However, Lucian is the first and one of the strongest Lycans. And although the full moon cannot turn an experienced Lycan, it can force a new Lycan to turn and can make it easier for an older Lycan. So Lucian's strength, plus the added strength from the full moon, allowed him to break out regardless of the silver. He breaks out from his chains, but only makes it to the wall. But this is when he calls to all the Lycans. Not only could Lucian call to all the other Lycans, but the wild werewolves also responded to his call, the same as when he saved Sonya. After escaping Castle Corvinus temporarily, Lucian finds a cave, and inside is where the werewolves live, the ones that are stuck in wolf form. They're able to recognize Lucian as one of them, and they don't attack. We don't see it, but somehow he must have been able to communicate with them and ask for their help. After re-watching this, it makes the first generation werewolves seem a lot more intelligent than I first thought. Lucian can also sense other lichens and werewolves, which is possibly how he found the cave, because he knew when they were about to attack Selene and a caravan of people. Lucian has a battle with Victor and seemingly kills him, but we see him still alive not long after falling in the water. Regardless, the Lycans and werewolves managed to kill every vampire except the Elders and Tannis. The Lycans took the castle for themselves and lived there for a while, until Victor sent Craven and a group of warriors to take it back. The story Craven told was that he managed to kill Lucian, but was the only one that survived. And to prove he killed Lucian, he had the piece of his branded skin. This story wasn't true though. In reality, the Lycans killed the vampires, but Lucian made a deal with Craven. Lucian knew that Victor would not stop hunting him, so instead of continuing to fight, he cut the brand from his arm and had Craven report him as dead. Craven would take the glory of killing Lucian and become the regent of the Old World Coven. The plan was eventually Lucian, with Craven's help, would kill the existing vampire elders 
making Craven their new leader. He and Lucian would then make a peace treaty with lichens and vampires. Not a bad idea if everything goes to plan. According to the vampire history books, it also says that Craven lit the great blaze that burned Castle Corvinus. Pretty good way to cover up the evidence that there would be no dead bodies. The vampires thought Lucian was dead, so he will use this time to build the lichen numbers up and formulate a plan to kill the vampire elders, because he knew as long as they lived, there would be no peace. At some point between Rise of the Lycans and the first movie, Lucian was in contact with Andreas Tannis again. Tannis was exiled after the Lycans took over Castle Corvinus, because being the Coven historian, he wanted to record history the way it actually happened. That Victor created the Lycans and started the war. Unfortunately for Tannis, Victor didn't feel the same way, so he accused Tannis of recording malicious lies and exiled him to a monastery. Tannis was going to get something in return, but he still risked his life to help Lucian and Sonya escape, and Lucian must have remembered this because somehow he finds Tannis and trades with him. Somehow Tannis became in possession of special UV rounds that are especially deadly to vampires. They are a bullet that was apparently used by the military as a tracer round, but was instead filled with some kind of irradiated fluid that emits UV. This makes them basically burn vampires from the inside out. It's possible the reason Tannis was doing business with Alexander was because Tannis was the one making the UV rounds and trading them to Alexander. Since we see Alexander's men and the cleaners using the UV rounds. In exchange for the UV rounds, Lucian gave Tannis lichen bodyguards to protect the monastery, women, and anything else he needed. One of Lucian's most important goals is peace and the merging of the bloodlines. His hybrid child was killed, which is probably why he becomes so obsessed with trying to create a hybrid. He has a lichen scientist trying to mix the vampire and lichen strains together in every combination, but nothing will work. No one's body can handle both viruses, unless it's a direct descendant of Alexander Corvinus. After tracing Alexander's bloodline, Lucian's plan was to use the blood of Michael Corvin, a direct descendant of Alexander, along with the elder Amelia's blood to turn himself into the first hybrid. It's unknown if this would have worked or not. When we see the Lycans in the first movie, they're living underground in the city, in an area accessible by the subway tunnels. Lucian's plan to kill the elders starts off well. They do succeed in killing Amelia by ambushing her train with Lycans, but because Victor is awakened early, it throws a wrench in their plans. Lucian ends up biting Michael, and this is how Celine learns about the real reason the vampire lichen war began. When lichens bite someone, the person will experience their memories. When Lucian bit Michael, he seen Sonya get executed by sunlight, and then he told Celine. Unfortunately, Lucian is killed at the age of approximately 800 before he gets the chance to try and turn himself into a hybrid, because Craven betrays him. But he does manage to tell Celine to bite Michael saving his life and turning him into the first hybrid. So in a way, Lucian did succeed in creating the first hybrid and merging the bloodlines. Once Celine finds out about what Victor did to his own daughter and Lucian, along with him trying to kill the man she was in love with, she kills him. Victor sowed the seeds of his own downfall. It's interesting to think about the fact that Celine's family was only killed because Lucian took the necklace that was the key to the first werewolf's prison, which I have a video on. So what happens to Lucian and Sonya directly affected Celine, making their stories intertwined. In the original movie, Lucian starts out as a villain, but eventually we learn his story is more complicated. We think Victor is the good guy, and Lucian is the evil Lycan who is trying to take over again. But after we learn Victor bred, that enslaved him and all of his kind, killed his girlfriend and unborn child, he seems pretty justified in what he did. It's important to remember that Lucian hated Victor, not all vampires, not even when he was a slave, not to mention he fell in love with one. This is his war, Victor's. He wanted to create a hybrid to merge the bloodlines and create a peace treaty. He didn't want anyone to experience what he did which is why I think he helped Selene and Michael, a vampire and a lichen in love. They would carry on his legacy. He might not have accomplished the final result himself, but he set the wheels in motion, which is why Lucian is one of my favorite characters along with Selene, 
Victor, Tannis, and Marcus. It would have been really cool to see Celine and Lucian team up together. Lucian does appear in the second movie, Underworld Awakening, but only as a dead body on Alexander's ship, and the ship is destroyed, leaving no chance for him to return. Hello, and welcome back to another Underworld video. This video is going to be the first of a character breakdown series I'm going to do for individual characters, and the first character I wanted to cover was Eve. I wanted to cover Eve first because I did a video on all of the species in the Underworld series, but I didn't really cover Eve in that video at all, so I've made this video to kind of cover everything. Eve, her full name possibly Eve Corvin, is the firstborn hybrid and is the daughter of Celine and Michael Corvin. She is also a modern day descendant of the Corvinus clan. She is a hybrid of both immortal species Vampire and Lycan. This makes her potentially the most potent product of the Corvinus strain to date, as well as the most powerful immortal. Her blood is sought out for its potential of giving someone else unimaginable power, making her a big target for many enemies. Eve was born and raised in captivity. Her parents haven't been captured by the infected persons unit before they could ever learn of Celine's pregnancy for themselves. Antigen, the biotech corporation that took custody of Celine and Michael, raised Eve as subject to, in captivity for the first 11 to 12 years of her life. Her caretakers told her that her parents had died when she was born, preventing her from learning anything about her origins or nature. However, she mentions that because of her psychic connection to Celine, she felt certain her caretakers were lying about her being an orphan. Only one doctor, her personal caretaker, ever treated her as anything more than a lab specimen, with others regarding her as merely an experiment. In the movie Underworld Awakening, when informed that she is soon to be executed, Eve breaks out of captivity and frees her mother, whose existence she had only recently learned about. Although Celine is originally ignorant of Eve's existence, their psychic connection allows Celine to see what Eve sees, causing her to track down the young girl. Celine is stunned by Eve's physical appearance and hybrid form, as well as the raw strength she exhibits. When Eve is recaptured by the antigen forces, Celine launches an attack on the company, during which Eve manages to free herself. She confronts Jacob Lane, the evolved Lycan doctor who had sought to use Eve's DNA to create a more powerful and silver-resistant race of Lycans. The two fight fiercely, culminating in Eve successfully defeating Lane when she literally rips his throat out. But although Eve has a vision of Michael escaping the facility, her father vanishes before she and Selene can catch up with him on the roof. Before the start of Blood Wars, Eve went into hiding after making Selene promise not to go looking for her. She left Selene with only a lock of her hair to remember her by. The Lycan leader Marius seeks Selene in order to discover Eve's location to take her blood and enhance his own powers, but learns that even Selene does not know her own daughter's whereabouts, realizing once and for all that he is unable to find her. After Marius' death, Selene becomes one of the three new vampire elders and remains at the Nordic Cavern where, eventually, Eve arrives looking for her mother, possibly being summoned by Selene. Eve is seen alive and well very briefly in the film, but plays no active role. Eve has long brown hair and blue eyes, and when in hybrid form her skin turns blue like her father's and her eyes turn black while her irises have the bright blue shade of Selene. She also cannot speak when transformed like Michael, reduced to growls, hisses and roars similar to a lichen. Eve appears to resemble her mother the most in terms of her facial features, save for her eyes which Selene claims are just like her father's. Her powers and abilities. The full limit of Eve's abilities are undetermined on account of both her pre-adolescence as well as her relatively short time in the underworld lore. Genetically, she is the most potent of immortals, possessing powerful attributes from each species as well as ferocity and bloodlust. Similar to her father, another lichen vampire hybrid, Eve demonstrates a bestial blood rage when she reveals her true nature. This seems to be what triggers her powers, as she does not possess any hand-to-hand -hand training or combat experience, relying on pure brute force to defeat her enemies. She possesses great superhuman endurance. Even at such a young age, Eve has demonstrated remarkable resilience for an immortal. She is seen to nonchalantly cut herself with no visible discomfort as well as likely recovering from severe blunt force trauma as an overturned car is being hit by an evolved lichen. Even before she had consumed any blood in her entire life, she only showed moderate discomfort from a rather severe lichen bite, even ripping the lichen's head in half after it bit her. Eve also possesses extremely powerful healing factors even by immortal standards. However, being deprived of blood for 12 years since she was born and until she was brought to the coven has weakened this trait of her into a seemingly human level. 
Still, after consuming blood for the first time, the bite wound healed at a remarkable rate, healing completely within seconds. This especially impressive because a lichen bite would definitely kill most vampires. After she cut her arm several times, the cut healed near immediately. She was also able to withstand the anesthetic gas for a rather long period of time before finally passing out. Similar to lichens, Eve's strength seems to be triggered by intense emotions such as rage or fear. As a hybrid, her raw brutality is more than sufficient to compensate for her age and lack of fighting experience even when confronted by transformed lesser lichens or an evolved lichen. Eve's most remarkable feats of strength include tearing a lower lichen's head in half even while wounded, holding a raging lichen at bay with a wooden door, and finally tearing out the throat of an evolved lichen. Selene believes that Eve is more powerful than any vampire lichen alive, including elders. As a lichen hybrid, Eve possesses sharp nails in her hybrid form, capable of causing severe damage. Presumably like her father, she can also grow them without fully accessing her hybrid form, but this is yet to be demonstrated. Eve is shown sensing the approach of a lichen attack in Underworld Awakening. She felt them before Selene. In theory, her senses could be superior to those of her mother, though Selene wasn't paying attention in this case, or her lichen heritage allows her to detect other lichens better. She is also shown disappearing from sight in a matter of seconds, eluding police officers, lichen guards, Jacob Lane, and even her own mother. Eve was able to launch herself onto a lichen's back with extreme force and she displays twists and flips when fighting. She can also jump extremely high without difficulty, once jumping up a wall of a room about 20 feet tall, reaching near the ceiling with ease. Eve has demonstrated the ability to cling to walls, seemingly even without skin contact as seen when she jumped up the walls of the room when she was imprisoned at the antigen headquarters while trying to resist the effect of the anesthetic gas. Like most other hybrids, as a hybrid from both immortal species lichen and vampires, Eve is completely immune to both ultraviolet light and silver in any form. One ability that only Eve seems to have is she is able to perceive images and hear sounds from the perspective of either one of her parents. It is explained that when she is within proximity to either her mother or father, her brainwaves fall into sync with them and she sees what they see, and they in turn can also see what she sees. For years, however, this only occurred between Eve and her mother as they were kept within close proximity. Her father was kept too far away from her for this to occur. The ability of sensory synchronization is apparently a random phenomenon rather than a controlled event. And of course, being an immortal as a lichen vampire hybrid, Eve is immune to aging and disease and her life will last hundreds if not thousands of years. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Underworld video. In this video we're going to be covering Jacob Lane and Quint Lane because they're kind of connected. Dr. Jacob Lane was the ruthless director of Antigen and the main antagonist in Underworld Awakening. He is also an evolved lichen, but he's not as powerful as his son Quint Lane since he hasn't inoculated himself with the Corvina strain as much as Quint. You can see here that Quint Lane is an absolutely massive lichen, towering probably around 15 feet tall, whereas Jacob Lane, he turns into more of almost like a wolfman form. He actually doesn't increase in size that much. A conversation between Dr. Lane and his son suggests that at some point prior to the purges, both he and Quint discovered the existence of the two immortal species and for unknown reasons opted to become lichens. His wife is also mentioned as having chosen to remain a human. Lane considers this her abandonment of himself and their son, However, this theory is only suggested rather than being stated. It is also possible that he and Quint were accidentally infected with lycanthropy and then attempted to force Lane's wife into becoming a lycan as well. He is later revealed to be part of the lycan's master plan to eradicate their vampire enemies. After Selene attacks Antigen headquarters, he attempts to escape with her daughter Eve as his prisoner. Selene rushes the van and tips it over, causing it to crash. While Quint is fighting Selene, Lane turns to his hybrid form and almost kills Sebastian when he tries to prevent him from kidnapping Eve. But before he can do so, Eve escapes and attacks Lane. As they fight, he gains the upper hand and pins Eve against a car. A vampire named David attacks Lane with a shotgun and shoots him twice, but he is unaffected by the gunshots. Catching Lane off guard, Eve attacks him and they appear evenly matched until Eve grabs Lane and slams him into the windshield of a car. She quickly rips out his throat and kills him. His powers and abilities. As an evolved lichen, Jacob Lane has raw strength and brute power and is capable of holding his own in battle. 
Lane seems to have more in common with the Lycan vampire hybrid Michael Corvin than with his son, Quint. As he is not as wolf-like, Lane is capable of sustaining incredible damage and still healing himself and can attack with tremendous strength and speed. However, his enhanced abilities are not as great as those as his son, due to the lesser amount of Corvinus strain injections in his system. We also find out that Jacob Lane and other members of Antigen were providing fake credentials and tests for Lycans after the purges. Detective Sebastian tells Celine that the government declared mission accomplished on the Lycans and were to focus solely on the vampire threat. So while vampires continued to be hunted down and eradicated, the Lycans were living in secret and strengthening their numbers. We also see the average Lycans in this movie being portrayed much smaller, described by David as diseased and starving, but this is probably only the Lycans that were accidentally infected and were living before the purges, not the ones that were turned after by antigen. After the purges, these Lycans were forced to live and hide in the sewers underground as not to be killed. David implies that something has them riled up, which is why they would risk showing themselves at all. These Lycans do try to chase after and capture Eve, so although they look a lot different than the Lycans we see in Antigen, they could still be working with the Lycans of Antigen. Although Jacob and Quint Lane are Lycans, they're more like hybrids because they're Corvinus enhanced Lycans, so they are resistant to silver and sunlight. And I think that if Jacob and Quint's only choice were to become regular Lycans that were weak to silver, I think he would have declined. I think being a hybrid was the only reason that they turned themselves because they wanted eternal life and all the benefits without any of the drawbacks. And now we have Quint Lane. Quint Lane was the son of antigen director Jacob Lane. He is a lichen enhanced with the Corvina strain due to the injections of the Corvina strain derived from the tissue samples stolen from the hybrid child, Eve. So Celine's daughter Eve, because she is the daughter of Michael Corvin, she is a direct descendant of Alexander Corvinus, the first ever immortal. And because of this, through her blood, they could inject themselves with it, giving them access to the most pure of the Corvinus strain, enhancing their strength to an even further level than the previous vampire elders. In my opinion, Eve and Quint Lane are probably two of the characters that could display the most raw strength of all the other immortals. Quint Lane is the polar opposite of the vampire Selene. Where she is a vampire enhanced with the Corvinus strain, he is a lichen enhanced with the Corvinus strain. His strength is extreme, even for one of his species. Due to his multiple injections of the serum developed by Antigen, he has the ability to heal almost instantly, as well as having an apparent immunity to silver. Due to his extreme strength, his father uses him as the muscle of Antigen, ordering him to hunt down any enemies or threats to the company, including attacking Selene and killing Lita, a scientist who had threatened to expose Antigen for their mistreatment of Eve. She threatened to expose Antigen after she found out they were going to kill Eve to harvest her of all of her tissue to make more inoculations for himself and the other lichens. Little is known of Quinn's background or family life other than a single comment made by his father suggesting that Quinn's mother abandoned the family by choosing not to become a lichen. Whether this points to Quint and his father intentionally becoming lichens, or whether they were both bitten accidentally and tried to force Quint's mother to become a lichen as well, is unknown. Although it can probably be assumed that both of them just wanted the added benefits of strength and eternal life, and maybe their mother didn't want to become a beast or a monster, she wanted to just remain human, and they couldn't let her do that. In Underworld Awakening, Quint leads the assault on Thomas's vampire coven, in which he and the other lichens kill nearly every vampire there. He and his forces then leave when Thomas and the remaining Death Dealers gift him with the Tri-Blood Hybrid. Quint then faces Selene in a final battle in the parking garage of his father's company, where she follows him in hopes of saving her daughter. When Selene enters an entrance that's too small for Quint, he is forced to shift back to human form. Selene confronts Quint for the last time and punches a hole in his stomach and stuffs a silver nitrate grenade in it. When his instant healing takes place, his wound closes, sealing the grenade inside of his stomach. The grenade explodes, and a second later he explodes too. Revealing his immunity to silver only runs skin deep, or is at least only a partial immunity. Quint is a brutal and cruel character. He is completely loyal to his father though, as his father to him. Quint is also seen being incredibly confident and in thinking he is superior to the other lichens due to his instant healing abilities and immunity to silver. As an enhanced lichen, Quint has the ability to change into a werewolf form more than twice the size of any normal lichen. His full lichen form closely resembles that of the first generation lichen, having more hair, more musculature, and a longer muzzle, and being mainly quadrupedal. He also has enough control over his transformations that he can turn only his hand and can presumably change other parts of his body as well. 
Quint's hand transformation is very similar to when Michael transforms just his hand in Underworld Evolution to open the paint cans. We have never seen a normal Lycan able to transform specific body parts, so I think we can safely assume this ability of controlled transformations of the body parts is specific to hybrids or Corvinus enhanced Lycans. However, when Quint changes, the transformation process seems to be quite painful, and when he turns his hand, he groans in pain. Let alone when he unleashes a full transformation, he screams in agony. This could be a cause of his grotesque and immense size in this form, or it also could be a factor that he's a new Lycan and he hasn't yet mastered his transformations like older Lycans have. In time, he could possibly learn how to transform faster and with less pain, but it could be that because his transformation is so large, it would still be painful. As a result of multiple inoculations, his enhancements are immense and he is physically far superior to Selene, an enhanced vampire. The only drawback of his huge size is that he seems to be fairly slow compared to normal lichens, and he must revert to his form to get through small spaces like cement doorways. So we can surmise by how Quint Lane's transformation worked and how he kept inoculating himself with Eve's pure Corvinus strain in order to enhance his own abilities, that if Selene continued to inoculate herself with the Corvinus strain, that she could also enhance her own abilities even further. It's important to note that Quint can endure attacks that would kill most lichens or vampires, such as Selene stabbing him in the head which we see killing two lichens in another movie, and shooting him with silver bullets, which he is shown to be almost completely immune to. Unlike the earlier installments of the Underworld series, Quint Lane's form was entirely CGI generated, whereas they usually sometimes use a mixture of a little CGI, but mostly practical effects. Also, given that the serum is experimental, it's possible that Quint's limited immunity could have been completely reversed with a perfect serum. Quint was also shown to have yellowish eyes in his giant lichen form while Selene was fighting him, despite the fact that his eyes turn black when he starts to turn, which was the normal eye color for a hybrid. It's also worth noting that since Quint kept receiving inoculations, it's possible that he needed to keep having them, otherwise he might lose his power and revert to a normal lichen. This problem could possibly be resolved if you could find a way to get the strain so pure that it was equivalent to getting blood from Alexander Corvinus, because as we know, Selene's abilities stay enhanced forever, and she never has to ingest more blood or more of a serum or anything like that. We see Marius suffered this limitation with Michael Corvin's blood, but stated that the blood of Eve, the source of Quint's power, would have made his abilities permanent. So it's possible that Quint's abilities were permanent. If you've made it this far, that's pretty impressive. If there's anything about Underworld or any other series you want me to cover, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed, leave a like. And if you haven't, maybe hit that subscribe button. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.